Greetings from Dallas Willard Ministries. I'm Bill DeWire, and before we get to part two, I'd like to recommend some friends on Facebook. Check out Dallas Willard is my homeboy. It's a great place to dialogue over ideas, ask questions, and it's fun. Now for part two, knowledge of God today, how it is possible. All right, in this session we want to concentrate on this thought, that not knowing God is a choice, that anyone who wants to know God can know God. And I'm going to really extend that to say anyone anywhere on earth, anytime, who wants to know God can know God because God will find them. And this is a very serious point in our contemporary setting uh, because currently uh, we have a system of education that teaches us that reality omits the spiritual, that reality is not spiritual, that reality is physical, and anything that amounts to spirituality is a spin-off of the physical. So the fundamental reality on the teaching that prevails in our culture is the physical world. And that would mean things especially such as that you are your body. And one reason why we cannot solve the problems of race and gender and so on is because we have no way of thinking about human beings other than their bodies. Am I saying anything that makes sense to you? You see, because the system of teaching that we have about reality is that <coughs> The physical is it. So you are your brain or your DNA or something like that. Right? And that's all there is to you. <clears throat> now I've enjoyed talking for the last few weeks about the recent discovery that they've now found a chimpanzee that has 99.4% of human DNA. So what does that mean? What is, what, what is the conclusion that is drawn from that by the people who are supposed to know? The conclusion is you are very like a chimp. <laughs> okay. That's the conclusion. Now, if you watch the news, and you know the news is a giant rumor mill that spins off of research that's done usually under the heading of university research. If you watch the news, you'll see time after time efforts to show that human beings are just animals. And now we have even something called speciesism. And speciesism is what people who think that human beings are better than animals are guilty of. Don't you feel yourself flushing with embarrassment? Because some of you probably believe that. And so you're now in a world where there's a serious question about that. Four or five years ago, there was a fire over in Malibu, which is not exactly news, uh, but this is, was a bad one. And a man went back to his trailer house to get his cat, and the fire killed him, and the cat survived. And the person who was writing the op-ed piece on this apologized for any suggestion that the man was of greater value than the cat. See, that's, see now you see worldview is seen in that form. That's worldview. Worldview is what creeps up on you and you, you find yourself, oh, well, I, I didn't think about that, but that's what, the tr that's, a, that's a problem. Speciesism is a problem. It's a worldview. It says human beings. Now, to go back to the chimp. Do you think that the people who published this result, that the chimp has 99.4 percentage of Mike's DNA here, do you think those people believe 
that the chimp has 99.4% of their experience? You think they believe that? They don't believe that. They don't believe it. If a chimp had 99.4% of the experience of my students, they'd make better grades than my students do. <laughs> because my students of, often are using a great deal less than 99.4% of their DNA in their studies. <laughs> So you see, now here's another conclusion. The chimp has 99.4% of Mike's DNA. What's the conclusion? There's an awful lot more to Mike than DNA. But that is not admissible because of the teaching about reality that is dominant. Right? Because experience is not physical. Experience is a different kind of reality. And we have lost the human self and we have lost human experience, intentionality, will, character, See all these people standing around in the street corners wringing their hands about character when they just lost all their retirement in Enron or something and they th they're worried now about the character of the man who was running it. Well, character is a big issue. We should be worried about character. But if we're going to worry about character, we have to recognize that a human being is not a physical being but a spiritual being because that's what character amounts to. Character isn't in your brain or your DNA. They're not going to find a DNA particle that uh, they could insert and make people incapable of telling lies. Um, that would certainly stop the traffic, wouldn't it? They did that. They're not going to find that because it's not in that category. It's spiritual. And so now, Growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ means to grow in interactive relate. That's spiritual reality. So that's where I say I am not just a physical being. I am a physical being. I'm not just a physical being. And my physical being is to receive spiritual life. See? My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, that means more than just words. That means that in this body there is a spiritual being which is me and I receive a spiritual being which is the Spirit of God. And that's interactive relationship. That means different kinds of stuff happen. See, grace is God acting in my life to accomplish what I cannot do on my own. I mentioned transparency and truthfulness. Nobody can do that on their own. Now, they don't have to, right? They don't have to. Because when they get ready to do it, help is available. But they have to want to do it. <laughs> they have to want to receive that help. Henry David Thoreau said, Men will lie on their back talking of the fall of man and make no effort to get up. You see and actually, that's what we wind up often doing in our religious circles. Talking about how well, we can do nothing without Jesus. Ah, well, that's right. And if you do nothing, it will be without him. <laughs> mm -hmm. See? It's when you trust him and act that you begin to know grace. Okay, I'll test your knowledge of old hymns now. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Do you know that song? Do you hear that song? That's a good song. That says the whole thing. See, so now God acting in my life to accomplish what I cannot do on my own. Now, when, if you do inductive Bible study and you study grace, 
Old and New Testament, you'll see that's what it is. Is it unmerited favor? Of course it's unmerited favor. But just to say it's unmerited favor does not tell you what form it takes. And so very subtly over history, the idea has arisen that the form it takes is a credit transfer, like wiring funds to an account. So that when you profess to believe the right things about Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sins, which he did, and if you believe that, then that wire starts humming, and all the credit you need to pay off your sin debts are transferred to your account. And now when you die and go up to the pearly gate, they will punch in your number. And it'll come out saying, owes nothing. And they won't be able to find any reason to keep you out. I hope you're going to think about the way I've told that little story. Because one of the primary blocks to people coming to a full knowledge of God in Jesus Christ is the idea that grace has only to do with guilt. It doesn't. If we had never sinned, we would still need grace. I will say that shocking thing once again. If we had never sinned, we would still need grace. We would still need this. And I've, uh, it's, it's, it's a real uh, problem for me not now to just launch into an hour's discussion of grace, but I can. But I hope that you will take these things about grace and do your inductive Bible study. Watch where grace shows up and see that this is what grace is. And to grow in grace does not mean to grow in forgiveness. It means to grow in the amount of God acting in your life. And that will be knowledge because knowledge is interactive relationship. Right? Now, to know God is a simple thing. You just have to be willing to let him be God and you have to come down to the point to where you have run out of tricks on your own. That's why Paul says, echoing the Old Testament, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But if you've got a few more tricks, he'll let you work those out. See, I can tell you what you always find God at the end of your rope. That's his address. <laughs> That's God's address. It's the end of my rope. If I've got a few more tricks, which it's very hard to get through all my tricks, then he'll let me work those out. And that's why so many people have been saved, really saved, and come to a solid knowledge of God by praying the sinners, the, the, uh, the uh, atheist prayer, as they call it, differs from the sinner's prayer. The atheist prayer is, oh my God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. And you would be surprised if you haven't looked into this, how many people come to know God through praying that prayer. But the secret is not the prayer. The secret was they were at the end of their rope. Now, there's all kinds of witnesses to the knowledge of God. We want to talk about some of those uh, in this hour. And uh, uh, I want to just uh, outline some of the main points in knowledge of God. You remember Paul says in, the, uh, in Romans 1, that what can be known of God is available to people. God has made it evident to them. This is Romans 1, 18 and 19. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, invisible, did we hear that word last time? What does faith have to do with? Faith is knowledge of the invisible. Faith is opposed to sight, but not to knowledge. So Hebrews 11 is about knowledge. 
Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 4. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. See, that's knowledge of the invisible. Paul says, if you just look, you will see his eternal power, divine nature, being clearly seen, being understood through the things that are made so that they are without excuse. No one has an excuse. Okay, that's why. Not knowing God is a choice. It's a choice. And so I want to just say a few things about some of the sources of this knowledge. And uh, I wish I had time to just do exposition here of Acts 14 and Acts 17 and Nehemiah 9, 6 through 10 and so on, but I don't. So I'm just going to be very uh, brief here and outlining. There are really three stages in evidence for God. Now, again, don't just think of it as head knowledge, but as interactive relationship. But of course, one of the places that we interact with God is in nature, in, in the world of Oh, the world of nature. That's a part of God's kingdom. By the way, that's one reason why you get so refreshed when you go out into nature. Right? I've spent a lot of time flying over the American Southwest. It's one of the most desolate places on the face of the earth. But I love it. Just looking down at all that desert and rocks and all that stuff. Isn't it amazing how a great pile of rocks and mountains will affect you? That's because that is God's kingdom. That is where, generally speaking, what God wants done is done. Now, here's one of the things you can know about any physical reality, and that is that it owes its existence to something else. It owes its existence to something else. That's true of the sun. That's true of the tree, the rock. That's true of our bodies. It owes its existence to something else. Now, that sequence of debts for existence, that, that line of causation that goes back and back and back, is not, cannot be infinite. It can't be infinite. It can't be endless. So, for example, if you have a, a line of dominoes here, and this one has just leaned over on that one, as that one leaned over on that one and knocked them down. Okay. Now, this sequence back of this cannot be infinite, because if it were infinite, it would never get to this one. That's what it means for it to be infinite. Or think it like one I like to use this. I have a copy in my office for which there's no original. <laughs> Believe that one? I love to fool around with this stuff. Because <laughs> if you learn how to just put it, you ever, no one has any doubts about it any longer, right? And. Uh, I actually have students who say, I'd like to see that copy. <laughs> see, finitude depends on something that is different in kind, and that's God. That's what God is like. God is self-sufficing being. He is a being that does not need anything else to exist. He exists out of his own nature. And if you, if you think about him like apples and rocks, then that'll be a problem for you. But the whole point is, that's what he isn't. Uh, he never didn't exist. So, mommy, where did God come from? The answer is, he didn't come from. He's always been here. Did he cause himself? No, he didn't cause himself, because he's always been here. Uh, all of the questions point to something that is self-sufficing, and that is precisely spirit. 
God is spirit, right? God is spirit. And now that was being given to a woman in John 4 to try to help her understand why it didn't matter where you worshipped. But the point of it is to make a statement about the nature of God. And of course it's, it's an old statement. Exodus 3.14. Moses gets ready to go down to Egypt. Who shall I say sent me? What's your name? And the answer is, I am that I am. That is to say, I am something whose being depends only on itself. I am that I am. That I am comes from I am. And of course you will know, I think, because I sense that you're pretty serious students, you will know that I am becomes a name for God, doesn't it? I am. The great I am. Right? Now, the translators have trouble with Exodus 3.14, and someone, some, you'll see it translated as, uh, I am what I am. But uh, if you remember your comic strips, even Popeye yam what I am. Right? <laughs> I yam what I am. Everything is what it is. That's not the point. The point is, here is something that doesn't owe its existence to anything else. And that's the nature of spirit. And we have a little experience of this in ourselves. The element of spirit in us is primarily will or power to choose. And that is precisely something that exists out of itself. It is not caused by anything else. Now that scares the bejeebers out of people who think they can reduce everything to law because it says there are some things that are not derived from anything else. And that's why in our world today, for example, people will never look for will as an explanation. They will always look for cause. And the social sciences, for example, including psychology, with a very few exceptions, say absolutely nothing about the will. And so they will have a long delay. Why are 50% of marriages, why do they end in divorce? No one will ever say, because the people who are married choose to get divorced. They'll never say that. Why is the leading cause of death in pregnant women murder? Oh, wow. You could really get going on that, couldn't you? <coughs> With causation. No one will say, uh, now you see, this is a part of the general picture of the rejection of spirit as a category of reality and knowledge. And often it's done with the idea that this is compassionate because we shouldn't blame people for what they do. Now there's an important point to that and, and uh, I don't want to, you to misunderstand me there. But we are not helping people by teaching them to say, I can't, when they could. Because it is only by making the will the executive center of the self that anyone can pull their life together and make something out of it. And the primary function of the will is to reach out to God and to begin to draw spiritual life into this system that we have that we call the human system. And when we begin to do that, then we say things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Right? See, that's choice. That doesn't mean that Jesus is going to jump on you and make you do things. That's causation. We're talking about spiritual being that lies back of the whole created universe. And then when we begin to look into it, we see that this spiritual being actually is not just a being. You know, the force be with you, brother. It's not that. It's a person. And actually that's what stops the infinite regress. It starts back here with something which is not just an event, but a choice. And moreover, an intelligent choice. 
God decided at a certain time to initiate, shall we say, the Big Bang. Okay? That's why it happened when it did. Because at that point God chose to say, let there be light. Light's the primal form of energy. Right? If you know enough about it, you can make fish out of it. And biscuits. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that, but the Logos knows how to do that. Right? So, now he shows up and begins to give us information about this choice, you see. It's very interesting how these arguments go, and I know that many of you know. Uh, and uh, J.P. and Bill Craig have just published a wonderful book. I think it's called Foundations of Christian Worldview. And I encourage, if, you're, if you get excited about the, some of these things that I can only touch on tonight, I recommend that you look at that book. But you see, as far as our evidence goes, for seeing something come into existence of a certain kind, the only source that we know is either something else that is already of that kind, generally speaking, or it's an intelligent being. So 747s, um, cameras, um, birthday cakes, we all know where they come from, don't we? They come from intelligent beings who utilize stuff at their disposal to make them. And as far as we have empirical evidence on the coming to be of organized things, it always comes from a mind. Now, of course, there's some things we didn't see come to be. Most of the things that we would call natural, we didn't see them come to be. Um, but as far as the empirical evidence is concerned, the reasonable thing to believe is that they came into existence from an intelligent being. And if we looked at the goodness of what he's made enough, and I recognize there are problems with evil, but if you just look, I often, when people come to me and they say, well, you know, there couldn't be a God who made a world like this, I say to them, what kind would you like for him to have made? And you get some pretty shallow answers. Uh, serious answer is a world in which people could not do what is wrong. And then you can work that out. And we have to talk about that in the next installments. But that would mean that there would be no possibility of the development of moral beings, moral character. And the price for that in a world like ours is sometimes too painful for us to observe. And yet when you say, what would you have done differently? It's hard to come up with an answer. Off you get, I remember some, a guy in graduate school and we were talking about this, waiting for the library to open. I said, what would you like for, how would you like for God to make the world different? He said, well, I'd like, like it where people didn't go to church on Sunday and, and look down on people who didn't. We can fix that one pretty easily, I think, you know. But that wouldn't do much for the world. And the truth of the matter is, when most people approach this issue of the nature of the world and design and choice, they don't think very deeply about it. And David Hume, one of the greatest uh, naysayers, people on the other side, after a lot of work, says in a couple of places, a rational being looking at the world must believe that it was the product of a very great mind. And really, that's, that's what we need at this level. You've already got at this level a, a proof that the world rests on something that is not of nature. And at this level, that what that something is must have been capable of choice and of thought and so is not just a force but a person. And then you're ready for the third stage 
of the reasoning, which is to look at human experience in history. And that would mean your own experience, of course, as well as the experience of others. Um, and there are a lot of, there's a whole, there are several categories of evidence involved here. But the primary one is the capacity of individual beings to experience God if they would like to do that. God is not far off. As Paul said to the people, the Greeks there on, in Mars Hill in Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. And when Jesus came, he preached that the kingdom of God is available. And uh, we mustn't miss the point about the statement, for example, Matthew 4:17, repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. That's not saying that something is about to happen and then suddenly it got called off. That's not the teaching. The, the language is very clear. It doesn't mean that. And now we have systematic and hermeneutics, liberal and conservative, which try to say that the kingdom of God is something that isn't here. It is something that is future or an illusion of some sort. Uh, which Jesus had, and uh, it didn't happen. He was a nice man, uh, but uh, he missed it. Uh, but these are clearly not what Jesus had in mind. What Jesus was saying is that the kingdom of heaven, now remember, the kingdom of heaven is where what God wants done is done. Okay? Or you can think of it as the range of God's effective will. That's the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't bring it into existence. Very old, the kingdom of God is from everlasting to everlasting. I mean, there wasn't a time when there wasn't a kingdom of God. <coughs> Even before creation, there was a kingdom of God. And what Jesus comes to announce now is that since he is present, the kingdom of God is present. And that anyone can live in it by simply trusting him. Now, not something he did, nor something he said. Trusting him, the person. See? That's what it means to say he's Lord. That's what it means to say Messiah, anointed one. That is to say that God's presence is here in him. And so when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's saying, think out your strategy on life again in the light of the fact that you can now step in to that kingdom. That's the gospel of Jesus. It's like if I were walking down through this house and someone were to say, turn because the library is at hand. That's not saying the library is about to happen and might not. It's going to happen. In, no, no, it's right here. See, and then when you read the Gospels, now you go back and read the Gospels and you'll see that that's the constant story. And this is captured in Luke 16, 16 and in Matthew 11, 11 through 12 until John, the law and the prophets were preached. Since John, the kingdom is proclaimed and people are rushing into it. They're not standing on proprieties because all that is required is to see Jesus and say, that's it. I give my life to that. And then you begin to experience, you experience the presence of God in human affairs. And these are the, what I call the three stages of theistic evidence. And uh, this one establishes that nature is not everything. This one establishes that the more than nature is intelligent personal life. And then this one establishes 
that this intelligent personal life is now interactive with human beings who open their lives to it. See, That's why you can say to anyone, you want to you know God? You want to know Jesus? Then start acting on what he said. And you do that, you will meet him. Right? You'll meet him. Start acting on it. Put it to the test. Put it to the empirical test. Now, can you avoid that? Yes. So we have to talk a little bit now about why God is a hidden God. And God is a hidden God. And you may remember the cry of the prophet, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. And everyone, I think, at some point, cries out, O oh God, come. Well, you have to think about what it would be like if he did. See? What would it do to your life? And the short answer is it would destroy it. If God literally came down, it would destroy it. And that's why uh, the teaching of the scripture about no man has seen God and lives is true. It would blow all your fuses and burn your wires out and you wouldn't have a life left. You see, God is so big that in order for us to avoid him, he has to hide. And he's willing to do that in order for us to come to the place to where we are prepared to trust him. And when we trust him, then he begins to move into our lives, but not in the way of an atomic bomb, in the way of electricity that gently filters through the wires and comes down to where we can cook pancakes with it. You don't want the atomic power coming in to cook your pancakes, right? I mean, your pancakes and you would be gone, right? You want that power to come in a way that it still leaves you and the pancakes there together. And that's, that's why God is a hidden God, is because he wants to leave space for you to seek him space to seek. Now the promise is anyone who seeks will find. You really want to know God, you can know God. Not knowing God is a choice. Evidences, realities are there for anyone. You want to take him into your business, into your family, into your community, you can do that. All you have to do is to invite him and watch for him and trust him and he'll come. Just like that. And he'll come in a way that will be a blessing to everyone involved. God's intention is to bring out of human history a community of people who are like Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. That's what human history is about is to bring out of human history a community of free beings who are like his son Jesus. Now, you know that that's true, don't you? Because you, you've read the Bible, and you know that that's br uh, bringing many sons to glory. Uh, Jesus leads the way. We're all meant to be little Christs. And eventually we're going to be that. You might as well get used to the idea give up early and avoid the rush, as they say. Say, that's for me now. Now, you know, if you say that out loud, it sounds a little hokey. Oh, you're going to be a little Christ, are you? Yeah. Well, what are you going to be if you're not a little Christ? Are the alternatives all that attractive? Not really. I can accept that. And I can take my stand in that and I say that's what my life is about because that in the end is what human history is about. And so God leaves room for us to choose or to reject him and that is why he is a hidden God. 
That's why he doesn't come right down on the earth and make his presence fully known. You remember that when he did that on Sinai, the mountain just sort of chugged away like a volcano. It was jumping up and down. There was so much energy on it. The energy in our sun has to be kept a safe distance of 90 million miles or so away. And that's like a spark compared to the energy that makes up God, the power that makes up God. So thank God that he has approached us in a way that allows us to trust him through Jesus Christ and begin to say, yes, this is what my life is about. It is learning to do the things and be the kind of person that Jesus was. And then going back to those four questions, you see, who is well off? Who is a really good person? How do you get to be a really... And now you have a perfectly coherent answer that can be tested by experience. It stands, the weight of evidence stands in its favor. And all that is required is a will which is prepared to say, yes, I give myself to Jesus Christ. Um, I mentioned in the notes here Bertrand Russell and Norwood Hansen. There are a couple of famous cases of people who uh, s said, well, you know, I'm ready to believe if God would just give me more evidence. Right? And uh, now, uh, what, can, what form would the evidence take? Well, Hansen suggests that it might take the voice of God speaking out of heaven to him and saying, I'm tired of your fooling around. I want you to line up and do what I want and forget all of this philosophical quibbling and obey me. Right. Now, do you think if Norwood Hansen heard that voice, that would lead him to belief? No, it would lead him to a psychiatrist. Right? <laughs> That's what it would do. Uh, because you see, that kind of thing never does the job. If you, if you have your will and your understanding set against God, miracles don't do the trick. Now, miracles are important as testimonies to the presence of the kingdom. But they will not convince people who are not seeking God. And that's why you remember in the case of Lazarus and Dives, the rich man and the poor man, uh, the Dives, the rich guy, says, well, send Lazarus back to my brothers so that they don't come in this place. Well, I mean, you have to use your imagination what would have happened if Lazarus had shown up at their door. You think they're going to fall on their knees and give up? No, they're not going to do that. And Jesus said that. He said, Neither will they believe if one is sent from the dead unto them. And no doubt he was referring to what was going to happen in his own case. There has to be a willingness to receive. Bertrand Russell said uh, to uh, Father Copleston in an interview, uh, uh, Father Copleston said to him, uh, what are you going to do, Bertie, when you stand up before God and you find that he exists? And Burton Russell said, I'm going to say to him, why didn't you give more evidence? Well, probably God will have an answer. <laughs> probably it will go something like, well, seeing what you did with the evidence provided, there was no point. <laughs> right? Or perhaps he would have said something like, I didn't want you to come on those terms. I didn't want you to come on the basis of being overwhelmed with the evidence. Uh, screw tape letters has so much wisdom in it. And uh, I wanted to just on this point read the little statement that's right at the front of uh, the divine conspiracy. This is screw tape writing to Wormwood. You must have often wondered why the enemy does not make more use of his power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree he chooses and at any moment. That's what we've been talking about here, right? But you now see that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. 
merely to override a human will, as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most mitigated degree would surely do, would be for him useless. He cannot ravish. He can only woo. For his ignoble idea is to eat the cake and have it. The creatures are to be one with him, but yet to themselves. Merely to cancel them or to assimilate them will not serve. Sooner or later he withdraws, if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience, all supports and incentives. He leaves the creatures to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from will alone duties which have lost all relish. He cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. Our case is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him, God, seems to have vanished, and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. That's what God is calling us to, because his intention for every one of us is that we should become the kind of person that he can empower to do anything we want. I'm going to say that again because you might have missed it. God's intention for each one of us, for every human being in fact, is that that human being should become the kind of person now that's character transformation. The kind of person that he can empower to do what they want. Imagine yourself being given the power to do anything you wanted. Now, I think normally you'd feel a little nervous with that, right? Because you yourself might worry about your wanter. You might think, I've, I've got a problem now, my wanter. My problem used to be I didn't have power. But now I think maybe it was a good thing. You remember Jesus said, he told stories about this. He said, well, a man gave some money to his servants and left. And he came back. And some of them had been very successful in using that money. And his response was to give them more responsibility. More responsibility. You've been faithful over little Take charge of ten cities. If you were mayor of Los Angeles, how would that go? I mean, not a mayor like we have now that can't do anything anyway because, <laughs> I mean, every, he's got built-in protection just because people know that rulers can't be trusted. That's the human problem in terms of government. How do you rule the rulers? Now imagine someone that you didn't even have to worry about that. Not only could you be absolutely sure they would do what was right, but you could be absolutely sure that God would empower them to do what was right. right? Imagine that person were you. You've been faithful over little, have responsibility over much. See, that's where we want to go. We have to understand that not knowing God is a choice. And uh, I've messed up my... This is the first. So make a division there. Not knowing God is a choice. 
and that if we want to know God, the evidence is there. And in particular, it is there at the level of his presence in human affairs in the form of the kingdom of God. And that if we want to live in a knowledgeable, interactive relationship with Jesus Christ, which we can recommend to anyone with any degree, pedigree, whatever, and say, test it, and you'll find it to be true. That is where we turn. It's precisely to the grace of God that is present and active in Jesus Christ and through him in us and anyone who says, I really want to know. And those are the people who are on the path of growth that leads to the place where God can empower them to do what they want. I want to just leave that thought with you for you to meditate on and to apply to you personally. Let's have a prayer now for the words that have been spoken. Father, there are wonderful people chosen by you in this room, and I ask that you would give to them the solid sense of the reality of your kingdom in everything they are involved with so that they can grow and appropriate knowledge of you, knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ as interactive relationship, opening the kingdom in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.